Hey everybody, how's it going? So today I wanted to go through another one of these articles where they try to explain why it is that you have a lot of people quitting their jobs. It says why American workers are quitting in record numbers. The number of Americans quitting their jobs has hit a record high over the past several months in a phenomenon economists have been calling the Great Resignation. In August, 4.3 million U.S. workers, almost 3% of the entire American workforce, voluntarily left their positions, the highest number since the Bureau of Labor Statistics began tracking quits in 2020. Workers are quitting at high rates in every industry, but the trend has been especially pronounced for frontline businesses like restaurants, hotels, retail stores, and healthcare providers. Again, healthcare providers, you're going to have a lot of people like nurses that may be dealing with patients that are being assholes. You have retail stores where you know, again, you're know you putting price tags on basketballs all day and dealing with customers that complain about everything. It's not exactly the most fun and often minimum wage. Hotels, you're going to have to deal with a lot of Karens and you have to have a fake smile on all day. And same thing with restaurants. You know, that they, many of them don't pay well. You know, you're, not, you're probably not going to find salvation financially from a jack-in-the-box job. Th these are all jobs where that kind of a suck. I'm saying that as somebody who had who did work as a retail worker for about a year and a half when my teenage years and also as in a restaurant for 40 minutes before I got fired instantly for screwing up everybody's order. The great resignation comes at a time when businesses across the country are struggling to find workers to fill open positions. There were 10.4 million job openings in August, down slightly from a record of 11.1 .1 million openings the previous month. Economists generally believe that relatively high quit rates are a signal of a healthy economy, since it suggests that workers feel optimistic about their prospects and have leverage to improve their circumstances. Um, I get, I'm not an economist. I didn't go to school for this. This is purely speculation on my part and purely my opinion, but that feels like bullshit. Really, really high quit rates means that you have less people working. Less people working means less goods and services being produced. Less goods and services being produced means crappier economy. I don't care how much you blow up the Dow Jones and S&P 500 and real estate bubble with printed money and low interest rates. What I care about it are what people are actually producing. Are people actually producing things of value? And the more people you have quit, the less people that are producing things of value, the weaker your actual economy, is what I would argue. In the short term, however, some worry that having so many companies unable to meet staffing needs could slow economic recovery and contribute to mounting supply chain issues. This sounds a bit closer to the truth here, which is that if you have less people making things, less people doing things, that you are going to have less things available to buy, supply chain issues, and it could slow economic recovery, particularly when those supply chain issues wind up leading to increased prices, which people are going to be less able to afford if they've all quit their jobs or other people are making less money. Why there's debate? Rather than offering one reason so, so many Americans are quitting their jobs, experts mostly believe that the Great Resignation is the result of a variety of forces coming together. That's what I want to go over in this video. Something not on that list is employer vaccine mandates, of course, because you're... Uh, of course, which don't appear to have caused a significant number of people to quit. I'm very curious how they are tracking that. One of the most common explanations is that workers are simply burned out. That's probably top of the list for me. For me. The high quit rates in the customer-facing jobs in healthcare suggest that people in these fields have become exhausted after 18 months of extra hours, confrontations over COVID mitigation rules, and fear of catching the virus. Many, okay, now, I have dealt with people that are pissed off at extra hours. I've dealt, I've met lots of people that say confrontations over stuff like, hey, can you wear a mask while you're in the store? They have just absolutely, they are sick and tired of getting cursed out at $6 an hour enforcing mask mandates while their employer sits at home writing the rules, telling them to do that. That is something I completely understand. Uh, fear of catching the virus. Again, this is, this is maybe me living in my own bubble, and p perhaps it is a sign of my own bubble. I haven't met a single person saying, I don't want to go back to work because I'm afraid of getting COVID, uh, particularly not in October of 2021. Maybe in March and April and May of last year, fine. Like, again, back when we thought the mortality rate was much higher, back before we had a vaccine, back when many things were a mystery. But I, I, I just haven't met a lot of people that, like, got both doses of Moderna or Pfizer that are, that are around my age group that are thinking, I am scared to death of going back to work. What if I get COVID as a 27-year-old healthy male that got both vaccines? I've, I haven't met any of that. And again, that could be a sign of my bubble. I really, I don't think that's it at all. I think you may actually find people that say that because it may be more societally acceptable to say that than this job sucks balls and I don't see a future working here, so I'm done. But I, I just, I don't, I don't see people that, that, that say that.
Many white-collar workers, on the other hand, may be eager to maintain some of the elements of pandemic-era work that benefited them, like remote work and flexible hours, and willing to move on as their employers transition back to the office. Others see the Great Resignation as the sign of a major shift in the power dynamic between workers and their employers. That appears to be the case here. Labor Bureau data doesn't track whether people are quitting or finding another position, but levels of job, record levels of job openings mean prospects for quitters have never been higher. While many have struggled financially during the pandemic, a large share of Americans have actually increased their savings, meaning they have more of a cushion to absorb a job transition. These factors mean workers have greater freedom to leave unsatisfying jobs. To, and this is something that people have talked about, which is that this is not something that's being driven by the free market. This is something that's being driven by government. When government has, you know, when they just spit out three or five trillion dollars of, of money, and a lot of that money winds up going to a bunch of different programs, you may, you know, it, it's without a lot of oversight, you may have some people that are making more money from the pandemic when they quit than they did when they had their job. Now, he, let's say you're one of those people that says, okay, you know what, this is, um, you, know, you can pay people more money to not work than to work. Let's just say you were one of those people, like hypothetically speaking, let's say that, I don't know, you just had, you were, you were dealt a shit hand in life, you had bad luck, uh, bad circumstances, and you work in a, sh a shit job that, and that job is actually paying you less money than what you got for the pandemic to stay home. At some point, like, there has to be a switch that flips in your head. And you may say that this is wrong, you may say that that's lazy, but you have to admit, there's a chance this switch would flip in your head, which is, I'm getting paid more now than I was when I was actually working 40 hours a week. And that, like, when that clicks in your head, and you actually have to go back to your job at, and go back to working 40 or 50 hours a week, and you're making less money it's going to be a really tough pill to swallow. It's going to be a really hard pill to swallow. Even if you are a hard worker, even if you have a great work ethic, even if you realize that this is just an entry-level job, it may be a year or two or three years from now, you'll find other opportunities and move up the economic ladder. That's going to, that's going to, it's going to remind you that you're getting kicked in the nuts. Because again, I worked those minimum wage shitty jobs. I worked those jobs assembling furniture in an unair conditioned mall, you know, the working at Avatar Studios for three months for free before I got my, my uh, paid position at $7.50 an hour. I was really excited back then because the production assistants got $7.15 an hour. Whereas us, you know, upper echelon assistants that worked in the tech room got seven fifty. I made 35 cents more than you, you peasant. But yeah, I mean, like it was... It, the, the, when I always had in the back of my head when I worked those jobs that I'm getting minimum wage or close to minimum wage because I'm worthless. And it was always this little negative self-talk in my head that didn't really get fixed until I started my own business and started offering services that allowed me to make, you know, 400 or 500 or 800 or 1,000 or $1,200 a week in the early days. It was, I had that little negative self-talk voice in my head. And it was always hard to beat that voice away. I knew what I was working these shit jobs for. It was, I wanted experience. I wanted to learn how to interact with other people in a business environment. I wanted to learn how to stop being, you know, a, a, a dumb young teenager that doesn't know how to act in a work environment. I wanted to learn skills that I could use to start my own business or work with my own clients. So I, I sucked it up, but it was painful to suck it up. And if you got somebody who was making more money during the pandemic than they were when they were working, it, it really does kind of amplify that little voice in the back of their head, which is I, a government program can pay me more than what I made when I was working. Wow, I'm really not valued by my employer at all. And that, and that little piece of negative self-talk, even if it's not the best thing for you, even if it's not the best thing for you to just quit and say, screw it, I'm going to stay home, I'd rather make nothing than work for peanuts, it's a strong feeling. And I can't say that I wouldn't have that exact same feeling, and I can't say that I wouldn't act on it. I like to say that I wouldn't act on it, but I, I, I honestly, I, pr I probably would. These factors mean workers have greater freedom to leave unsatisfying jobs to pursue something that suits them better. On top of these short-term influences, some experts argue that the pandemic has led to a more fundamental and lasting impact on Americans' relationship with work. They argue that the human tragedy, and in some cases indifference from their employers, that workers have experienced over the past year and a half has led millions of people to deprioritize work in their lives. This is a believable one. You know, if, if your boss says, I am not going to go to work because I'm concerned about COVID, but then he says, by the way, you have to go to work from 12 to 10 because we need money. That may make it slightly more difficult for 
you to want to continue working for that place. One thing that I did in the beginning of the pandemic is uh, when the customer service staff was, uh, stayed home I, and the shipping staff stayed home, I worked the front of the store and I did shipping and I also did customer service. I figured if anybody is going to actually catch this, A, we kind of let people stay further apart in the store and we were also cleaning everything with alcohol the moment it came in. I figured if anybody's going to get this first, it's going to be me. I'm in the front of the store. I'm the one that is speaking to people when they walk in. I'm the one that is opening the packages with the, with uh, everything in it. And we had a, like a nice little 70% alcohol spray and a microfiber. We're spraying everything and UVing it when it came in. I figured if anybody's going to get it, it's going to be me. And one of the reasons, uh, oh man, Erica likes to listen to NSYNC and Backstreet Boys in the car. So the moment I said that, I had a flashback of, anyway. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, any any time uh, somebody came in, I was the one dealing with it. And now part of why I did this is, well, I mean, if somebody's going to have to do customer service, so I figured, you know, it should be me. But mainly, I wanted them to see if anybody's going to get this first, it's, it's going to be me. Uh, it should, should be me. I mean, you know, I run the business. I'm the owner of the business. Uh, if anybody is going to be the one that is going to have to take any sort of risk, if there is a risk to your health or anything else, I mean, it should be should be the owner, not the freaking people working there. Uh, but I have heard stories where you get, you have owners that said, oh, you know, you got sick. Oh, uh, so sad, too bad, come back to work in four days. If that was the case, if you got COVID and your boss was still enforcing the bare uh, minimum in sick days that you were allowed or not paying you when you stayed home when you were sick because of COVID, I, I completely understand why people would say, you know, F this place, I'm, go I'm gone, I'm out of here. If you have a family member that gets sick and you want to stay home to take care of them and you only have two or three sick days left and you need five and your boss tells you no, I mean, again, you may need the money from that job, but that may have just put you over the edge to say, F it, I'm not coming back here. And if you are that type of employer, and now you're wondering, why is there a labor shortage? Why does nobody want to work for me? Why didn't my employees want to come back? It might have to be because you treated them like fucking dog shit. And if you didn't treat them like dog shit, they might actually show back up. What's next? The big unanswered question about the Great Resignation is whether it's a short-term phenomenon brought on by extreme circumstances or a more lasting shift in attitudes towards work. If it is in fact temporary, it's possible there could be a correction in the near future that sees quits drop dramatically, some economists say. I don't think it's short term. I think, as I've mentioned in my prior videos, a big part of this is people are seeing that the carrot is just simply too far away. You could dangle a carrot in front of somebody to get them to dance or do some work, but as the carrot gets further and further away, <clears throat> excuse me, it is going to be difficult to get them to actually do the work that you want them to do. And in this case, if the carrot of, let's say, living on your own gets so far away because of inflation, because of low interest rates, because of printed money, then it's just going to seem pointless to a lot of people to work. I don't know what it was for other people. For me, the f primary driver behind me wanting to get my own job as a teenager and wanting to work and save money away was I wanted to live on my own. If not on my own as in my own apartment, at the very least, I wanted the ability to, excuse me, <clears throat> I wanted the ability to have roommates. I wanted the ability to have roommates and not live with my mother because my mother was kind of mentally ill and would scream until two or four in the morning every single day for about, uh, you know, 11 years. I just didn't want to be around that anymore. It didn't matter where I lived. It didn't matter how many people. It didn't matter how grabby the neighborhood. I just wanted out. I wanted to live on my own. That was the primary driver of me getting a job. So if I was not able to live on my own, even if I got a job, then I might have just said, screw, screw it, and just stayed in my original shitty situation, living with, who was from all intents and purposes, a mental patient. Now, when you look at housing prices, when you look at some of the videos that I've done recently, you'll see that there are apartments where people are actually engaging in actual bidding wars, where they are spending $700, I mean $700, more than the cost of the actual apartment as it's posted. So this is something that I posted a few days ago. People are writing love letters to landlords to get a New York City apartment. People are willing to pay six or $700 over asking price for an apartment. When you see a house that you're like, maybe I could afford that, you know, it's $230,000 in 2019. And then in 2021, it's from two or three, like $390,000 or $290,000. And now it's going for 450 or 500. You're looking at the pace and it just kind of starts to feel like a joke to you. If you wanted to live on your own, if you wanted your own home, the last year and a half demonstrated to you just how hopelessly screwed you are. Because if you're making $30,000 a year and the home that you were looking at jumped up by $180,000, that means that in one year, in one year, that home jumped in salary 
by about five years. That home jumped in value by five years of your life. You would have to work five years of your life to make up for how much that home jumped in value in one year. And if you're looking at the prospect of moving out or getting an apartment, and there are people showing up for bidding wars just so that you can get access to a dumpy 400 square feet shithole in New York City from you know, 100 years ago, you're probably going to be discouraged. You're going to think, listen, I know I need to work. I know I need to have a job. I know I need to make money. But I'm so far away from ever being able to get the bare minimum that why bother? Maybe I just should sit and wallow in my current shitty position. I'm not saying that's a good thing. That's a horrible thing. When people just full scale give up, that, that is one of the worst things for an economy and a society that could happen. But I think that's what's happening far more than people saying, I'm 27 or I'm 17. I got both COVID vaccines. I'm healthy, but I'm afraid of going back to work because of COVID. No, it's because they, the carrot is so far away. It's pointless. Now, we could argue all day as to what causes this. Is it foreign investment in real estate? Probably. Is it artificially low interest rates that cause lots of speculation and cause people to bid on homes or buy second homes and homes that they don't even need? I would say that has a lot to do with it. Over the last 13 years, we haven't really taken our medicine from the 2008 recession. We've just kind of, uh, you know, been on uh, Novocaine with these like asininely no low interest rates that have gotten even lower over the past year and a half. And I think that that's actually going to exacerbate the problem and make it worse because as housing prices go up, and I think that I, again, there's really no show of this stopping as the money printing continues with no show of this stopping as every asset class is inflated in price including housing and apartments with no evidence of this stopping i think that people are going to feel more and more screwed causing more cascading quits because again even if dunkin donuts goes from 12 bucks an hour to 14 bucks an hour does that really matter to you when the place that you were looking at that you wanted to live went up in price from, you know, like the $1,300 a month to $1,700 a month? Like, and when you have four, when your living expenses go up by $400 or $600 a month, does it really, really matter to you if Dunkin' Donuts is willing to give you a dollar or two dollars more an hour and put it on the sign outside? Probably not. Perspectives. Frontline workers are fed up. Frontline workers in healthcare, childcare, hospitality, and food service industries pushed to the brink of human endurance decide that the grueling hours, inadequate pay, lack of balance, and abuse by employers and clientele are no longer acceptable trade-offs for their mental and physical well-being. That's probably a lot of it. So, you know, good on Carla Miller for noticing that at the Washington Post. I think that you would, you know, one of the things I get told a lot, and particularly when I, when I break up with someone or when I fire someone, it's always, but that wasn't really that bad. Like that last thing you're talking about, that's something that can be adjusted or fixed. I, I you know, I can do better. Uh, that, that wasn't really that much. Really, we're leaving over this. And it's, it's never that one moment. It's never that one customer that screams at you. They'll always say, well, you dealt with that two weeks ago, so why are you not willing to deal with it now? You know, if you were willing to deal with that two weeks ago, you were willing to have me uh, yell at you two weeks ago, you were willing to have me compare you to your fa to my father two weeks ago, you were willing to live a sexless life two weeks ago, why are you not willing to do that now? And the response to that is like, oh, it's always why now? Anytime I fired somebody or broken up with somebody, it's always why now? Why not before? Why not before? You should have done this before. And honestly, yes, you're correct. I should have done this before. I shouldn't have put up with a relationship that is miserable before. I shouldn't have had an employee that took eight hours to do 45 minutes of shipping before. I shouldn't have put up with someone that couldn't solder a QFN properly to save their life before. But I did. And that's my mistake and my failure. I'm going to correct it by not doing it anymore. Any of the people that are complaining about this, they'll go, what are they? They're just complaining. This is the same thing as before. Yes. But does that mean that what they were dealing with before was acceptable? Probably not. Does that mean that they should have accepted what they were accepting before? Probably not. And once you get that wake up call where it's like, damn, I'm getting treated like shit. I've been saving up for the past five years to be able to afford to move out on my own. Now I got to save up for another six years to afford that same place. Fuck this. You probably should have said fuck this three years ago, but better late than never. Better late than never. It's something to understand. Anytime you're leaving a bad relationship, a bad job, a bad, uh, you know, you're firing somebody that you should have fired a long time ago because they clearly don't give a shit about the job no matter how much you pay them. Always remember that. Better late than never. Don't get stuck in that sunken cost fallacy. COVID-19 plays systemic problems in sharp relief. Workers were expected to show up every day and risk their health for less than a living wage without the support of childcare benefits, which was a raw deal before it became, for many, untenable. I think they're talking, okay, now if your kids are stuck home from school, that is probably going to be something that makes you realize I got to spend more time at home and that could contribute to people quitting. Again, I don't think a lot of it has to do with people like 
being afraid of, again, a lot of these quits are happening right now. You have to understand this. We're not talking about quitting happening in March of last year, May of last year, or even December of last year. We're talking about post-vaccination uh, quitting. I, I don't think that people are, uh, ri are looking at this saying, I'm risking my health by a large margin in a post-vaccination world. I could be wrong. Lots of job openings means it's easier for workers to move on to something better. People have options, and because they have options, their demands and their interests and their tolerance for things that are not aligned with their values and how they want to live their lives, they're going to leave and they're going to look for it elsewhere. That's probably a big part of it. Again, if, if, there, if people are competing to hire you, if there are lots of job ads out there and employers are more than happy to give you a signing bonus, uh, you know, a paid training, or offer you more money than they would have a year ago, that's probably going to entice you away from working at a Dunkin' Donuts or a McDonald's, which is, in my opinion, a shit job. The balance of power has shifted in workers' favor. For at least two generations, workers have been on their back heels. We are now seeing a labor market that is tight, and prospects are becoming increasingly clear that it's going to remain tight. It's now going to be a workers' market, and they're empowered. I think they are starting to flex their collective muscles, says Mark Zandi, economist of time. I think that is correct. The pandemic has accelerated a generational shift in attitudes towards work. The Great Resignation is not a mad dash away from the office. It's the culmination of a long march towards freedom. More than a decade ago, psychologists documented a generational shift in the centrality of work in our lives. Millennials were more interested in jobs that provided leisure time and vacation time than Gen Xers and baby boomers. They were less concerned about net worth than net freedom, says Adam Grant. I don't know if millennials are less concerned about net worth. I think that... I think that they are concerned about both, and I think that you have to be concerned about net worth a little bit more now, given that your net worth is more important now, in my opinion, than it was back then. Yeah, when you look and you see that minimum wage was two bucks an hour and a house was around twenty k, that's different than when you see minimum wages at seven bucks an hour and a house is six hundred k. You know, there's there's a difference there, and I think that you know right now you're paying a greater percentage of your pay for rent or a mortgage or a house than you were back then. So, I mean, net, I, don't, I can't speak for everybody. I could just speak for me. I'm, I, I'm concerned about freedom, but I'm also really concerned about net worth as well. And I think it's kind of a luxury that you can be concerned about net freedom now to the extent that you couldn't before. Again, whether it's the gig economy, we can argue all day about whether that is actually freedom or slavery, but whether it's the gig economy where you can choose when you work or whether it's your ability to work from home because of the internet or your ability to be a freelancer because of the internet and having platforms like YouTube and instead of having to, you know, uh, go out of your way to b produce your, your music or your news or your, your art for a record label, you could just self-publish. There's many more options for f doing things freely today than there were 50 years ago. So probably were people that cared about freedom 50 years ago. They just didn't have the platforms or the technology to be able to do it in the same way that we did today. Many employers took their workers for granted during the COVID recession. See, since forever, the conventional wisdom held that in downturns, the employer could get away with almost anything. Employees needed work, and so they'd be grateful merely to have a job. Frills and niceties were 100% unnecessary. But the common thread that runs through virtually every motivation for the great resignation departures we are seeing is a decision to no longer accept the unacceptable, says Philip Kane. I think they're, they're rewording what others have said earlier, but that, that does contribute to it. Again, now, if you do have options, if companies are offering way more money and engaging in bidding wars for employees the same way, sadly, renters are engaging in bidding wars for apartments in New York City, I definitely would be less willing to tolerate a shit job. The pandemic led millions to reevaluate their priorities. We know that when human beings come into contact with death and illness in their lives, it causes them to take a step back and ask existential questions. Like, what gives me purpose and happiness in life? And does that match up with how I'm spending my life right now? So in many cases, those reflections will lead to life pivots. I think if you were barely hanging on, if you were just barely making it, like your rent, after your rent, your food, your electricity, your metro card, your cell phone bill, your gas bill and everything else, you really had like 100 or 200 bucks left, and then you got called uh, non-essential, and now you're looking at 10 or 20K in back rent that you got to pay, and the government only covers like three, two or 4K of it through their assistance program. You're probably looking at this and thinking, yeah, I got to do something different. I got to, this isn't working. I got to do something different. If you were just barely skating by before, what this taught you is that your life was not sustainable, because all it takes is one small blip to knock 
everything off the rails. And once you see what it's like when everything gets knocked off the rails and you see just how fragile your financial life is and how, you, how f uh, fragile, if anything, life can be if you're actually around people who had gotten sick and died of COVID, unfortunately, then you're probably going to look into doing something different altogether. And that reframing of your life may not include working for $12 an hour at a Dunkin' Donuts. And that's completely understandable. You know, many of these places that are bitching that they can't find workers, let's be honest with ourselves, they're not really good for society to begin with. Like, how good is Dunkin' Donuts for society? Let's say every Dunkin' Donuts in the world is closed today. I mean, would you maybe seek a healthier breakfast? Would you maybe eat less sugar? Would you maybe eat more healthy? If every McDonald's in the world closed tomorrow, like 100% of them, what would take their place? What would take their place for you as someone who's getting a meal for yourself? Like, Would you eat healthier? Would you be happier? We don't know, but maybe that's actually the case. Many of these places that are complaining that they're not able to find employees, again, if every jack-in-the-box in the country closed tomorrow, would America be a better and healthier place for it. Think about it. Pandemic relief programs have given many workers more financial freedom. Thanks to several pandemic relief checks, a rent moratorium, and student loan forgiveness, everybody, particularly if they are young and have a low income, has more freedom to quit jobs they hate to hop to something else. True, but this is not something that can last forever. These programs cannot last forever. They, they wind up doing, in my opinion, sincere damage to the uh, future economic prospects and financial prospects of the country if and, and if just the financial cluster f over the past year is any indication we have bubbles in literally everything now we have bubbles in commercial real estate bubbles in residential real estate bubbles in the stock market there are so many bubbles to be pricked at this point you could toss a needle around the air and you still wouldn't catch all of them uh, this is not something that can last forever. So I wonder if it were, if employers are going to actually wind up changing things or if they're just going to wait it out because this stuff can't last forever. With New York City commercial real estate, as you can see, they're just waiting it out. Like those places that are $75,000 or $50,000 a month when they're half the size of my store, they're still seventy-five dollars to $50,000 a month at half the size of my store. They probably will be until the end of time. But I'm very curious to see how this works out in the, in the labor market. Some of the current wave of quits is simply making up for last year's low quit rate. It's also possible that many of these mid-level employees might have delayed transitioning out of their roles due to the uncertainty caused by the pandemic, meaning that the boost we've seen over the past several months could be the result of more than a year's worth of pent-up resignations. Very possible. You know, if you were unsure if there was going to be an economy in the future, if you thought that the world was truly coming to an end, you might have held on to your job, even if it sucked. And then if you noticed the world didn't come to an end, it just had a shock, then you might be like, okay, never mind. And, oh, wait a second. Okay, not only is the world not coming to an end, but other people are willing to pay me more than this place. I'm out of here. So let me know what you think of this article. Honestly, this is one of the best articles that I've read on it altogether. So thank you very much to Mike Bebernez at Yahoo News for aggregating this. Usually when I read these articles, it really just focuses on the univariate analysis of a multivariate and complex problem and situation. They focus on one reason at the expense of all the other reasons, and it often winds up being window dressing. This really was, a, I think, a good aggregate collection of all the different reasons and all the different theories. Some I disagree with, some I intensely agree with, and I think properly represent what people are feeling at this point in time. Let me know in the comments down below. If you've quit your job, if you said, fuck it, I'm not going back into the labor market, I'm not going back into the working market, why? Like, not just the reason that you, t that you tell the world, but the reason you tell yourself. Like, deep down, not just in your brain, but in your heart. Why? Was it a good decision? Would you do it again? What would you advise other people to do if they're in your position now that you see what it's like after the past year and a half? I'm very curious what you all think. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And I honestly, I enjoy learning from you guys as well. You know, I started trying to do this little PlayStation modding business when I was about nine or 10 years old. I also had like a little bike washing business where I, uh, I had a when I was 16, I got a job at Model Sporting Goods. Then I got a job at Lowe's Home Delivery. Then I got a job at a furniture store and Avatar Studios. But admittedly, it has been, what? It has been, at this point in time, 13 years since I had a job working for somebody but myself. So admittedly, it is, sometimes it can be difficult for me to have the perspective of an employee 
you know, I, I, even though I feel like I have that perspective because I just, I don't see myself as a quote business owner or quote boss or, you know, or, or some or a business owner or anything like that. The reality is that's what I am. I spent three years of my life, actually probably, yeah, I spent four years of my life being employed by other people. And then I spent the next 13 years of my life, um, not being employed by other people. So the reality of it is I may have your perspective completely turned upside down or be completely off because as much as I like to think of myself as not some sort of high up CEO boss or business owner and closer to a normal employee, that's just fundamentally not who I am anymore. So I can get these things wrong and I'm just kind of curious uh, what your perspectives are. So, and I enjoy reading them in the comments from time to time. That's it for today and I'll see you in the next video. Bye now.